Welcome to Screw the Commute, the entrepreneurial podcast dedicated to getting you out of the car and into the money with your host, lifelong entrepreneur and multimillionaire, Tom Antion. Hey, 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 and double hey, hey, this is Tom here with episode 43 of Screw the Commute podcast. This is my Monday weekly training, the top 10 ways to be great when you do a business presentation. That's our topic for today. I'm talking both for the boardroom or on a big stage. These things will help you. All right, I hope you didn't miss episode 42 with Mitch Davis. He was a waiter who saved up four grand to start his business, which wasn't easy in the mid 80s. 35 years later, he has one of the top expert platforms where you can promote yourself for media interviews. All right, please, 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 please. If you like this podcast, subscribe, review, and share it like crazy. I promise your colleagues will thank you for it. All right, now let's talk about the sponsor. Well, look, I got to buy a lot of throat lozenges to do this. All right, see, I couldn't even get that out. So there's a lot of talking here. So I'm going to be mentioning lots of public and professional speaking resources, all in price ranges, uh, in all price ranges that you can you can get throughout this episode if you really want to go further with your training here. So help me get those lozenges. I don't want to have to do a GoFundMe account for it. All right, let's get to the main topic. Top 10 ways to make great business presentation. Now listen to this. Wow, what got into him? Or, oh my God, she rocked it. Or... He knocked it out of the park. We're going to get that contract. Or Jennifer was the best speaker we ever had. Are you hearing those kinds of comments when you stand up and give a presentation? Well, here's one that I got after being invited back year after year to Mark Victor Hansen's mega seminar series. And, And by the way, he's the chicken soup for the soul guy. Here's what the meeting planner said. We can't help but invite Tom back over and over. People have been scratching out 10s on the evaluation form and writing in 15s for him. And not to mention, Mark earned 75000 bucks of the quarter of a million I brought in just about every time I spoke there. Now, this episode is going to give you 10 of the things I always do to get the kind of results you just heard. You see... A successful presentation is memorable, and the people attending should leave motivated and inspired. (laughs) You might say, well, Tom, I got to do a presentation outlining the pay cuts I'm implementing to my company. (laughs) All right. right. I I understand that, uh, you know, how are you supposed to motivate and inspire people when you're telling them that, right? You'll be lucky to get out of the meeting alive. Uh, I understand that sometimes there's going to be tough audiences and tough messages, but that's an even more important reason you do everything you can to become a strong, likable, sympathetic, and trusted voice whenever you stand up in front of a group. Now, if you're screwing the commute and you're not in any corporate setting, you may just sell a lot of products in the back of the room like I do. I've sold millions of dollars and I rarely do less than 100000 bucks whenever I speak. And that's not pie in the sky and it's not high pressure or being a jerk. It's just using specific techniques and having the right product mix to sell. Now, I got a separate training on that at antion.com forward slash pro speaking. And of course, well, that'll be in the show notes. What I want you to do is think about all the speeches and presentations you've heard. How many do you remember? Which ones did you tell your friends about? Which ones motivated you? See, as a speaker presenter, you should spark a desire in your audience that makes them want to change. Your presentation should be professional, informative, and meet the needs of your audience. And I mean, it's got to have clear goals and strategies for those <laughs> to meet those goals if you want 
all this good stuff to happen. So if you follow these 10 steps, you're going to strengthen your credibility as a speaker, presenter, and greatly improve your presentations. And just a side note here, you're hearing me say speaker, presenter all the time, right? Because I have a big audience of people who want to be or who are already professional speakers. But many of these techniques are used just as importantly in boardroom or small group presentations in your business. Okay, so let's get into it. Number one, research your audience. It amazes me how presenters will just show up and really not know anything about the people they're speaking to. Many presenters just get lazy and they feel their message is so important that anyone would want to hear it. They couldn't be more wrong. I mean, your core message might be about the same for everybody you speak to. But being able to relate to that exact audience will personalize the information and strengthen your message. People are going to relate much better to the information that's going to really enhance your credibility. Now, getting the info you need is not that hard. Your goal is to make the audience know the presentation they are witnessing was created specifically for them. So what do you do? You start by interviewing the program coordinator or whoever called the meeting. See, before you stand up there, you should know the ratio of males to females in the audience, range of ages, cultural diversities, international customs and taboos you might run into, the history of the organization, which you should already know if you've been there or if it's your company the company's career highs and lows, and the backgrounds and goals of your audience. And that's just the name of a few. I mean, the, the more you know, the better. See, in my training, I include a pre program questionnaire, which leads you through all these questions. One of the best methods to get the information you need, and, and I've proven this method over many years, is by picking up the darn phone and calling people that will be in the audience or the meeting and speaking to them personally. If it's a group I don't know and the crowd is expected to be large, I call a minimum, minimum of 15 people to get a cross section of who will be there and what they would like to get out of the presentation. If it's a smaller group, maybe in my own company, I might speak to them in person before the meeting to get their input. Yeah, it's time consuming, but this allows you to engage with your audience in ways other presenters are too lazy to do. And that's how you'll get those great comments. That's how your speaker fee rises. When I quit corporate speaking over 20 years ago, my fee was 20000 and I'm not any kind of big celebrity. If you're a pro speaker, by calling and taking the time to personally interview your audience members, you're going to maintain high fees and get great evaluations. You'll really take your speaking business to the next level. So here's your first resource, amazingpublicspeaking.com. It's got over 475 professional level and amazing public speaking materials that are gonna improve your speaking techniques and strengthen your presence. So check it out in the show notes, amazingpublicspeaking.com. This is episode, let me think, this is 43. All right. You can also, the show notes are at screwthecommute.com slash 43. All right, number two, practice. Now, don't, don't people always say practice makes perfect? Well, they're partially right. I mean, the new saying is perfect practice makes you sick of practicing and makes you want to quit. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think that's exactly the way the new saying goes. But anyway, you have, you got to practice. Uh, now, this, this segment on practice is going to be a little bit longer because I want to clearly explain some practice techniques to you. So practicing is the only way to look polished when you're speaking. And you can't delegate this to anybody. You have to practice yourself. I mean, hey, it's you on stage with the microphone, and it's you who's going to look either great or like a schmuck. It's your choice. I got to tell you, you're sadly mistaken and egotistical to the max if you think the PowerPoint slides that either you or someone else created 
is going to make you a dynamic speaker? They won't. I want you to be so great, all your computer stuff could blow up and the audience will still think you were the best speaker they've ever seen. How about that? Now, there are specific techniques used to practice that don't take much time and they make you look really, really polished. When I say they don't take much time, you don't have to sit down and do them and stop everything else. In fact, that's counterproductive. I'm going to show you that right now. One of these techniques is called BITS, B-I-T-S. You practice a short piece of material, maybe a couple minute section, out loud, listen to this, 30 to 50 times. <laughs> I know you're saying, are you crazy? 30 to 50 times? I mean, it's like that, that lady on that funny YouTube video. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> I'm going to put the link to that video in the show notes because it is hysterical. <laughs> anyway, here's the deal. If you practice something maybe five or ten times, it sounds rehearsed. But once you practice it 30 to 50 times, something magical happens. It starts to sound conversational. And that's what you want. Now, you don't want to practice it word for word. Just talk your way through it. People that try to mem memorize things word for word totally blank out on the entire segment if they mess up one word or there's some distraction that throws them off. You definitely don't want to go blank. <laughs> All right, talk about looking like a big doofus, right? <laughs> so here's two more important things about this technique. One, you must do it out loud. You can't just do it in your mind. Your lips don't always go where your mind is telling it unless your lips have practiced, all right, as much as the rest of you. <laughs> and two, you must practice while you're doing something else, taking a shower, doing your hair, exercising, or wherever you can do it without looking like a nutcase in front, in front of people, right? I mean, this way, an earthquake could happen in the middle of your presentation and you'll be able to spit out a great and polished segment. Now, over time, you'll develop more and more of these bits and then you can string them together to talk for a long time without using notes. And guess what? When you don't use notes, people think you know what you're talking about. <laughs> now, here's another thing I consider a dumb idea. Many speakers and speaker trainers tell you to practice in front of a mirror. This is a terrible idea. The, the only time this is okay is if you're working on funny facial expressions for humor or you want to make sure your clothing isn't doing weird things if you get a new suit or something. Other than that, forget the mirror. Using it's going to make you less likely to move your eyes around the room because you're so focused on your own face. I want you to practice like a room full of pillows or stuffed animals using a broom or a hairbrush as a pretend microphone. This is not to say uh, you have to do the stuffed animal thing every time you practice. No, you're still going to practice your bits anywhere and anytime you can. So I want you to practice making eye contact with each stuffed animal or pillow. And I, in the early days, I struggled with this. Uh, I would fixate on one part of the room instead of making eye contact with as many people as possible in the audience. Now, uh, here's something to keep in mind. If, if one of those stuffed animals raises their paw, <laughs> either you've had too much to drink or, or you may not be explaining your subject well enough. <laughs> oh, I have a good time amusing myself here doing this podcast, folks, in case you want <laughs> So practice engaging with your audience by moving around the room. And if possible, even practice in the room where you're going to be speaking and try to visualize the event. Here's a, a great rule of thumb. If you're going to move around, move at least three steps in a direction for a purpose. If you want to address the right side of the audience, walk over there. And then walk all the way back to address the other side. And then walk back to the middle. Don't 
just sway around like you're a buoy in the ocean. It's, it's extremely extra, uh, distracting and reduces your power considerably. Very distracting. Here's another thing. I highly suggest you record your first 100 presentations. <laughs> Don't give me that. Ain't got no time for that <laughs> thing again. You want to be good at this, right? You want to be great. You want to get those big paydays. Well, put in the work. Audio recording is good. Video is even better. If you listen and watch closely to, you, uh, to your presentation after you're out of the heat of the battle, you'll notice that the slightest differences in the way you say things may sound better and get a better response from the audience. This is the best way to gauge how your audience reacted to your message. This continual testing enables a story or a piece of material to evolve over time. You can also have your speech transcribed and mark where you hear positive and negative responses from the audience. So I'm going to have a, a super cheap and super fast transcription service in the show notes uh, because this really helps your speeches go way, way better when you can look at what you actually said as opposed to what you think you said in the heat of the battle. You can check it out afterwards. So here's some more things you should practice. Changing your pitch, tone, and loudness. You want to avoid a dull, monotone delivery. And, and I got a super tip for you that hardly anybody knows about. If you want to be instantly, I'm talking instantly more interesting, in general, emphasize the adjectives and the verbs when you talk. Let me repeat that. If you want to be instantly more interesting, in general, emphasize, that was a verb, by the way, <laughs> the adjectives and the verbs when you talk. Now, here's an example where I'm going to describe something just plain normal, and then I'll emphasize the adjectives and the verbs. All right, here we go. My living room has a gorgeous button-tufted couch that screams quality. All right, that's the plain old version. The good version, my living room has a gorgeous button-tufted couch that screams quality. See, now I'm overemphasizing this here for you, but uh, that was way more interesting. So you can practice that. Let's go over that. Gorgeous and button-tufted are the adjectives. And screams was the verb. Here it is again. My living, my living room has a gorgeous button-tufted couch that screams quality. Now, if you start paying attention to this one tip, it will be much more interesting to listen to you. And you didn't even have to change any of the words. Just emphasize them and you'll be dynamic instead of boring. All right. Once you're ready to take your speeches to the next level, get professional coaching. A reputable coach will be able to objectively evaluate your current abilities and formulate a plan for you that will take you to the next level. And guess who would be a perfect candidate to help you out? <laughs> Yours truly has trained more professional speakers, I think, than anyone living. I'm not kidding about that. So check out my speaker mentor program at antion.com slash pro speaking so that I can buy throat lozenges and keep talking. <laughs> this is episode 43. So the show notes are at screwthecommute.com slash 43. All right. Tip number three, take care of hecklers. Now hecklers are attention starved people and their sole purpose in life is to interrupt speakers. No matter how great a speaker you are, you will eventually be heckled. And just because you're in a, a business presentation and the person isn't drunk yelling, your mother wears combat boots, or you suck. <laughs> I mean, nowadays, I guess you could be wearing combat boots, but, <laughs> but now I undress. I mean, now I digress. digress. <laughs> you're still, if that's any of this stuff that happens to you while you're speaking, you're getting heckled. Now, there are a few techniques for dealing with hecklers, and wouldn't it be nice if we could just crush him into oblivion <laughs> All right, like a stand-up comic would do? Well, unfortunately, that doesn't go over very well in business environments. It'll probably get you sued, actually. 
Now, remember I mentioned this in the first tip about researching your audience? Another great benefit of speaking to people before a presentation is it reduces the chance of hecklers and negative Nellies that hurt your results. In fact, if I'm going to a new group, I'll ask, who are the people always giving the presenter a hard time? I make it a point to interview that person and ask them for their opinion. They just want attention. Mentioning something they said in your presentation makes them my little star and, and can shut them up, all right, and keep them from hassling you. This virtually eliminates the chance they will give me a hard time because I'm praising one of their opinions, which gives them the attention they're craving. This really works great, but just don't do it too much because everyone else knows that person is a jerk, all right? And they may think you are like him or her if you refer to them too much. Don't do that. Mention a wide variety of people that are in the audience and just make sure the bad ones are included, which normally keeps them at bay. So for more tips on dealing with hecklers, visit antion.com slash wakebook.htm. This is my classic book about being great on stage called Wake Em Up Business Presentations. Antion.com slash wakebook.htm. Of course, we'll have it in the show notes. All right, before we go to number four, I want to do a couple brief shout outs for some of the people who helped me launch this podcast. Jan McInnes is a funny keynote speaker and a female comedian. You can check her out at theworklady.com, theworklady.com. Lynn Pierce is the poster child for her website, it's called AgelessLifestyleAfter50.com. I mean, she looks like she's 12 years old, so she's a perfect ch poster child. AgelessLifestyleAfter50.com. And Jean Borders, a, a, another student of mine, uh, Lynn was also a student of mine in the past, um, at Jean, J-E-A-N, Border.com. She's a holistic healer for people and animals. So let's we'll have them in the show notes and uh, check out their websites. Uh, they were really helpful in the, starting this podcast. All right, let's go on to number four. Use emotional language. So what really moves you to action? Facts or emotion? When those animal abuse commercials come on, are, are you only listening to the facts? Or are you emotionally drawn in by the images? Well, most people are drawn in by the images. Boring old facts rarely move people to action. Now, the exception to this is if you have a totally analytical audience, like maybe engineers. And, and I'm not disparaging engineers in any way. It's just they have a different kind of mindset. And that might not even be true, depending on your topic. So, so again, you must talk to them before your engagement to find out. So anyway, learning to use words that evoke emotions in people will make a much greater impact when you speak. There's many emotions you can trigger in the audience just by your choice of words. Happiness, anger, nostalgia, things like that. But you've got to know your purpose for being in front of the group. This is, this is going to help you choose which emotions you want to evoke. See, when your purpose is known, choosing words to get the desired emotional response is much easier. And again, I'm harping on this. You've got to know your audience. For example, if you ask the audience, do you remember when you were a child and you could barely get to sleep Christmas Eve because you just knew that Santa was going to bring you that special something? Well, if your audience isn't entirely Christian, some of your audience members will not relate to your message and it might get lost. So you got to choose words and experiences your audience can relate to. Now I want to give you an example from my Wake Em Up Business Presentations book. I'm, I'm going to read a passage with a set of facts. Remember, we're on using emotional language here. I'm going to read the revised version of the same passage with emotional language inserted. Now you tell me which one of these passages would be more effective in getting the money and action that they're looking for here. All right, here's the factual one. There have been 11 accidents in the past year at the Sharp Curve, which is two miles north of Cherokee Lake on Route 857. 
installation of guardrails, warning signs, and a flashing light will cost approximately $34,000. Even though we have not balanced the budget this year, I feel that we should appropriate money for this project. Thank you. All right, so that's the basic set of facts. Now, here's a little different version that uses emotional language to get the message across. Are you ready? All right, here we go. On July 18th of this year, John Cochran was found dead. The radio of his car was still playing when the paramedics got to his overturned vehicle. John's neck was broken. It was snapped when his car flipped over an embankment. No one here knows John Cochran because he did not live here, but he died in our neighborhood. Most of you do know the hairpin turn on Route 857 that has been the scene of 11 accidents this year alone and has injured many friends as well as strangers. We need money to put up guardrails, signs, and a flashing light. I know money is tight, but I hope you see fit to find the funds to remedy this situation before the unknown John Cochran becomes one of your loved ones. Oh, man, I still get goose pimples every time I read that. All right. So I hope you can see the difference in these two appeals. The first was simply a set of facts, and facts are certainly important, but they rarely stimulate people to action. The action comes when emotions get attached to believable facts. And you can bet the second version of the above story would have the best chance of securing that 34000 bucks. Let's break it down a little bit, the second version. Here's some of the emotionally charged phrases that were inserted. John Cochran was found dead. The radio of his car was still playing. See, I'm painting a picture in people's minds. John's neck was broken. It was snapped. His car flipped. Hairpin turned. He died in our neighborhood. See, all of these phrases were woven into the original set of facts to create the emotional response of horror about this terribly dangerous turn. Yeah, I, I get it. This is a dramatic example. But if you get good at this in all kinds of situations that aren't quite as dramatic, your results when you speak will go through the roof. I got lots of training on this stuff. Again, we got my Wake Em Up book. We got the amazing public speaking membership site. We got the Wake Em Up video professional speaking system and my pro speaking mentor program. All of these where I can help you with this stuff. And those last two, you get a lot of personal one-on-one -on -one time. Okay, doke, let's hit tip five, and that is reveal yourself. Now, I, didn't, I did not say expose yourself. <laughs> That's a whole different kind of presentation. <laughs> but don't be afraid to be human. I mean, remaining aloof and mysterious might be sexy, but it will damage your chances of making a dynamic connection with your audience. You certainly don't have to reveal your deepest, darkest secrets, but you can reveal your favorite hobbies, what you do to relax, your family dynamics, your educational background, and, and, and hey, make fun of yourself. Jeez, nothing makes people like you more than when they can laugh at you and with you. So allow them to connect with you emotionally by revealing Let's say a low point in your life and how you climbed out of it and get where, to get where you want to be. Your audience should know why you're speaking, your commitment to your topic and your product, and why you're committed to them. Reveal enough about yourself so your audience will want to know what you know. Show them the real you. You'll have a better chance of connecting with your audience and getting them to listen to you if you open up a little bit. Just like we saw a minute ago, you might be great at facts, but facts alone rarely cut it. And one of the, the compliments I get all the time, I really appreciate them, is, hey, he's the same off stage as he is on stage. There's no pretentious stuff. Yeah, I have to do techniques on stage in front of big audiences to control things and make things happen. But still, I walk off the stage and I laugh and joke with you just the same as on stage, and I'm still got good information for you if you ask me a question. So uh, try to be the same. Be yourself. And this reveal yourself is uh, is really powerful. And I, gotta, 
I mean, I made millions of dollars speaking. I mean, giving facts and information is maybe half of what I do when I'm in front of people. The other half is from entertaining them with humor that applies to what I'm talking about. And you're going to learn about that in a couple minutes and also from revealing myself. I mean, things like I'm always for the underdog and I stand up for them and I love animals and I contribute large amounts to animal rescue and I've done other really big charities for children and I've had trouble with my weight and I've said the wrong thing in situations that made me look really stupid right, or embarrassed and I'm terrible at cooking and I actually shot stuff on the ceiling. This is true. <laughs> when I'm trying to make a recipe one time. I mean, people love this stuff. When they see you screw up, combined with all the great things they're learning for you, it really humanizes you. And <laughs> i got to tell you this story. When I first started speaking, my topic was humor in the workplace and, and how it increases morale and productivity and that, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Every time I think of this, I crack up. Uh, not at the time I didn't crack up. I was talking about uh, keeping pictures of your pets and your kids and your grandkids at your cubicle to make you feel good during the day. <laughs> I walked over to a lady and I said right to her, wouldn't it be nice if you had pictures of your grandkids at your cubicle? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I mean, she, she looked at me with, it, when they say daggers in her eyes, they were daggers in her eyes. These were swords coming out of her eyes. <laughs> Daggers. The entire room went silent. And of course, this is not good for a humor seminar. I don't need to tell you that. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh my God, her grandchildren must have died in a car accident or were run over by stampeding herd of elephants on a safari. I mean, I had no idea what was going on. So I, I just... I knew something was wrong, but I didn't have any choice. I had to keep going. So I switched topics. And I finished the seminar. And afterwards, I was talking to the meeting planner. And I asked her, what, what went wrong when I was talking to the lady about grandkids? And she motioned for me to come closer. And, and she whispered in my ear, she's only 35. <laughs> oh, man. Could, could I have done anything worse? I mean, I could have murdered somebody in front of the group and i don't think it, it could have been worse than telling someone how old they look in, in front of their peers <laughs> oh geez so this section is on revealing yourself right so there i just revealed to you what a dumbo i was <laughs> okay let's go to number six is the use of props this is a really good skill to have and to practice this i make people just look around them wherever they are and see what they could use to help make one of their points in their presentation. You have to be willing to step outside the box on this one, okay? And well, let me change that to stomp on the Bosch box and crush it into oblivion, <laughs> all right? And you got to try something new each time you present. And props can really enhance your playfulness on one hand, and they can really intensify your presentation on the other. doesn't have to be funny. See, people can really anchor a thought in their minds when it's connected to a prop or a visual, a physical visual. And that physical visual or prop should always relate to the point you're making. Now, and I'm not talking about your visuals on the screen. It's definitely something physical that you can either pick up or point to when you're in front of a group. And always relate the point to, uh, excuse me, always relate the prop to the point you're trying to make. And make sure the audience can see the props. So you can use large and little small props or funny, serious props, all those. But if it's small and you're in a big group, you have to tell the video guy ahead of time to zoom in on it while you hold it still so people can see it on the big screen. Another thing I do in mid-sized groups is walk around the room holding it out so people can see it. In a boardroom or small group setting, you could just pass it around so people can actually touch it. And props can be used to help you remember what to say. It's similar to bits. It's just a different way to, to remember what you're supposed to say on stage. I used to use three funny hats as props. One hat was one of those ball caps that has 
long hair attached to it in the back that made me look like a hippie. All right. Now, inside the ball cap, I hid a piece of paper reminding me to talk about when the business was young. And as I'm putting it on, I glance at the paper and nobody knows I have a cheat sheet. And I got lots of ways to show you how to put hide notes all over the place and nobody will ever know about it. Then I had a top hat kind of thing like an Abe Lincoln thing. Then I would talk about as the company matured and and then I had a safari hat and I talked about now we got to search for new business. Now, if from my research of the group, if that told me that the leaders were lots of fun, I let them wear each hat as I talked about it. But make sure you clear it with them first. But it's a lot of fun when the leaders are going along with things. And if you explain that to them ahead of time, how much the people will love it if they can go along and play, be playful, uh, it can really work out great for you. I mean, I've brought mannequins on stage, dressed up like a gorilla. <laughs> I had the CEO dress up as Elvis one time. And I've learned magic tricks. We actually have a site on that, magicforspeakers.com. That's the number four, magicforspeakers.com. I mean, I'll do whatever's necessary to get my point across in a more memorable and interesting fashion. And props don't always have to be funny or crazy. You could have a mock-up model of your new building. You could hold up a new tool that makes you more efficient and pass it around so people can look at it. Any physical thing can be a prop. And here's a tip for using props. Remember, you are talking to your audience and not talking to the prop. You're not a ventriloquist looking at your ventriloquist dummy. You look at the audience while they're looking at the prop. I mean, the prop should not steal your attention away from the audience. And in many cases, you'd want to hide your props from the audience until you're ready to use them. Your prop is going to lose effectiveness and your message might get lost if the audience is focused on it the entire presentation when you're not talking about it. You gain their interest by surprising them. And there's all kinds of fun things you can do with props. Now, get yourself a cheap membership to AmazingPublicSpeaking.com uh, for ex extensive information on props and all kinds of other stuff. It's got 475 videos showing you all this stuff. And Hey, I told you I needed to buy throat lozenges. <coughs> so you got to support me here. <laughs> all right, let's go to number seven. My wake em up speaking system incorporates many attention gaining devices. A little background info here. Here's some examples. Stage movement visuals, voice inflection, gestures, facial expressions. And we just talked about props, and there's a lot more of these attention-gaining devices. One of the most important is the appropriate use of humor. Today's audiences and business people expect that the best presenters are going to have some kind of entertainment value. And, and don't worry, you don't have to be a stand-up comic to be a great presenter. But there are tremendous advantages of using humor appropriately to help reinforce your points and keep attention and gain rapport. All right, let me talk a little bit about rapport. I mean, do you listen to people you like more than people that are neutral to you or that you don't like? Of course, you listen to people you like. Humor can help establish and maintain that rapport with your audience. It also makes you more likable and fun to listen to. It allows the audience to relax. This is another benefit when faced with heavy material. I mean, even Shakespeare had what they called comic relief in the middle of these heavy tragedies. Now, your humor should relate to your audience and to the point you're trying to make. This will make your presentation way more effective, and I've got a section in my training called Bomb Proofing or how you can make sure you pick and deliver appropriate humor that won't get you in trouble. And humor is going to make your, your information way more memorable, so keep that in mind. And like I said, you don't have to be a stand-up comedian to use humor in speeches and presentations, and you don't have to tell jokes either. There's many ways to add humor that don't require any skill at all. And if you're smart, even if you don't think you're funny, you're going to use them. Now, here's a couple examples that don't require any skill. 
I'm going to give you, I think, three examples here. You could show funny visuals. So you don't have to be funny. The visual is funny. Just make sure it makes the point you're trying to make. You could read something funny. And, and here's an example from when I was speaking on humor in the workplace to reduce stress. That was years ago when I first broke in. So here's what I read to them that I got out of Time Magazine. I gave credit to Time Magazine. Here's what I read. There's so many stress reduction programs out there, people are getting stressed out trying to pick one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> See, I didn't make up that thought. I just picked it because it was appropriate to my topic. I gave credit, and I just read it. People laugh like crazy. There's no copyright problems with any of this when you're doing this. Here's another one. And, and again, I'm back to my audience research. I'm going to harp on that till you get it. You could just tell or read something someone in the audience told you during your phone call with them prior to the presentation. I'll never forget this one. I mean, I think the audience members got hernia as they were laughing so hard. All right. So I, I was speaking to a bunch of government employees, and one of the people I was talking to was telling me about their pay scales just weren't adequate, and we we're discussing other things that were going on in that state's government. And she told me, <laughs> and, I, and I quote, <laughs> the reason the governor is building so many prisons is because when the state employees have to start committing armed robbery to make ends meet, he'll have some place to put us. <laughs> when I gave, uh, read that and gave her credit, I swear I thought the building was going to explode. Those people went crazy and I made her the star, but guess what? Who got the credit for doing the best presentation they ever had? That's right, yours truly. You can do this. I mean, just yesterday, before I recorded this, I was helping a speaker uh, jazz up her presentations in a field not really known for humor. So I told her to go Google and type in chemical engineering humor. <laughs> All right. And you would think that's going to be pretty sparse, right? Then I told her to click on images where she could find all kinds of cartoons on the topic and T-shirt sayings and stuff like that. She was laughing like crazy on the phone uh, when she was on the phone with me on things I couldn't even see the humor in. But that's the point. Chemical engineers could see the humor. That one tip alone made her a much better presenter. Now, there's a caution here. Don't reprint a cartoon or show it from stage without permission. The simpler way is just tell about the cartoon and what it said. It can be just as funny and you have no copyright infringement problems. Here's a for instance. I love this. I saw a cartoon one time where Superman was in bed with a woman. And the woman was crying and she was all sad. And the caption was, I can't help it. I'm faster than a speeding bullet. <laughs> oh, man. So, so using humor appropriately can change the course of your, your business. Hey, listen, and your life. Let me tell you about an informal study I did when I lived outside of Washington, D.C. See, there was a magazine called The Washingtonian. I don't even know if it exists anymore since I moved out of there a long, long time ago. In the back, there was a personal ad section. For a year, every month, I would count the total number of ads, and then I would count the total number of ads that in some fashion, the ad was saying they wanted a person with a sense of humor. 70% of the ads wanted someone with a sense of humor. Now, I suspect the other 30% did too. They just didn't put it in the ad. These ads were little tiny classifieds. So when I say humor can change your life, I mean it. Now, you do have to use common sense. Now, I was teaching a group of professional speakers in a humor class how to do a singing opening, okay? Now, a year later, a guy that was in the audience came up to me, and he was a little bit mad, and, and he told me that singing opening was the worst idea he'd ever heard, and it bombed terribly. <laughs> so when, when I got him to tell me what happened, he had tried to do it in front of a 99% male crowd of attorneys and CPAs 
all vying for a big piece of business. <laughs> I mean, the idea wasn't stupid. He was. At, at the training session, he apparently missed me saying, this works better for all female audiences on lighthearted occasions. Okay. <laughs> and not to try it on male, all male audiences at serious business meetings. All right, here's the deal. I've got a three-hour webinar on how to use humor in business presentations that could literally take you from where you are to five levels higher uh, when you do a speech or business presentation. It's for all levels of presenters and guaranteed there's something for everyone. You can add a little bit of levity, a mild, if that's your personality, or you can have them rolling in the aisles with what you learn in this webinar. It's not about stand-up comedy either. It's specifically, I mean, that's a whole different skill. This is specifically for speakers and presenters and business people. It's about carefully using appropriate amounts and levels of humor to smash home your business points, be more likable, and increase your leadership skills by leaps and bounds. And, and one last warning, like drinking, you must use humor responsibly. Because one tasteless joke can destroy your credibility and in today's atmosphere, your entire career. So check out this three plus hour training. This skill has been worth millions of dollars to me over many years. It's really worth you learning this stuff. Check it out at greatinternetmarketing.com slash make laugh. Greatinternetmarketing.com slash make laugh. And of course, we will have it in the show notes. Episode 43, screwthecommute.com slash 43. All right, now let's move on to tip eight, which is move them to action. If you're going to bother to take up people's time to speak to them, challenge them to do something positive because of your presentation. For example, challenge your audience to follow your 10 steps to success for 30 days or some other specified period of time. Give them something exact to do you don't want them thinking well that was nice now what's for lunch you know <laughs> not giving them a call to action is pretty much the quickest way for you to be forgotten an effective speaker or presenter has the ability to move their audience to some kind of action now if you've been diligent in knowing your audience's needs i keep coming back to that over and over folks and i don't do it just to hear myself talk this is really really important to know your audience. If you know them, you can focus your presentation on teaching your audience how to overcome their adversities and how to reach their goals. You can evoke emotions in your audience by telling a story of a low point in your career and you reveal the strategy that led to your success and the techniques that you use to maintain it now. And even if they fail, it's still better, just like that guy I just told you about. Even if they fail, it's still better than doing nothing because they will at least get a chance to learn something from their mistake. And regardless of the size of your ego, the reality is you are there for them, not the other way around. If you concentrate on their needs, you will establish a lasting connection, great rapport with your audience. In addition, you'll come across as a powerful speaker which will increase your popularity, strengthen your reputation. So make absolutely sure you give them a call to action at the end of your presentation. All right, we're on the home stretch. Number nine is next. Bring solutions. One of the best ways to increase your credibility and the rapport with the audience is to bring solutions to their problems. If you've done a thorough job of researching your audience, are you getting sick of that yet? All right, uh, I'm going to come back over and over and over to that. You should already be knowledgeable about their problems and prepared with solutions. Nobody wants you to stand up there and go over all the problems without giving them some hope there's a way out of the problem. I'm going to go back to, hey, nobody got time for that, right? Sure, you have to acknowledge the issue or problem, but you better have some ideas on how to fix it. Plus, you can get buy-in from them by taking suggestions from the audience on how to fix the problem. If possible, you might even reveal a time in your life where you were in their current position so they can relate to you better. Then 
maybe they'll be more willing to accept your solution or plan of action because you've been there, done that. If you can bring the solutions and effectively solve their problems, you'll increase their motivation to get behind you and buy into your solution. Or if you sell products, actually buy your solution. People come to you for ideas and strategies that will improve their current situation. It's your job to lead them in the direction of success. In modern day thinking, this is what motivational speaking is all about. No longer is it good enough to to just get folks all fired up and they're bouncing off the walls, but they still don't have any plan on what to do with all this excitement and motivation. Modern professional Motivational speakers bring solutions and a strategic winning plan of action, which is in itself motivating. So bring solutions. Okay, here we are at big number 10. Pay attention to logistics. All of the best preparation, practice, audience research could be ruined if you forget to pay attention to all the details surrounding the presentation. The atmosphere should complement your speech, but you're not always able to present in an ideal location. In fact, most of the time you can't. Before you speak, you should be aware of the venue's lighting, the seating, what's behind you in the background, the ceiling height, the door locations, where the emergency exits are. You should know where the important people are sitting, who they are, whether or not part of your audience may be seated with their backs to you, like with round tables at a luncheon. You should know every aspect of the meeting and any other speakers before or after you. Once you're knowledgeable of the logistics, you can tailor your presentation to fit your surroundings. So here's a few questions to ask before speaking at any engagement. What are the seating arrangements? Are there round tables, classroom tables, chairs only? Or will people be forced to stand? I've done that in barns before, all right? How big is the screen in the room? Will alcohol be offered? What's the lighting like? Can it be dimmed? Are there spotlights? What's the ceiling height? These are just a fraction of what I know before I walk on stage. And here, I'll give you an example of something that I saw, another presenter who didn't do this. He had this big, beautiful thing with balloons, but you needed a ballroom with 30-foot-high uh ceilings so he tried to do it in in a like an eight foot ceiling room it was just stupid looking see i would have just not done it if i knew that i was in that room and found some other exciting thing you got to know what you need if if there are any presentation tools that are essential to your speech you should ask the coordinator if these tools will be available to you if not you might have to bring them yourself portable sound system Things like that, recorders. All these items and many more can impact the overall effectiveness of your presentation. I mean, literally, the same exact words delivered with significantly different logistics could be received entirely different ways. I mean, you can go from a fantastic evaluation to a bomb solely on the seating. And I'm not kidding. It's up to you to know the logistics of the room and how those logistics will impact your presentation. And knowing these things will make or break your career. See, people want to get excited about what you're bringing to them. Your presentation can't be just okay. It has to be great. Your career, especially in back-of-the-room sales, if that's applicable to you, depends on it. You got indoor presentations, outdoor presentations, screen size, sound system. What's all these things are critical. And do you have to end at a certain time? What do you do if your time gets cut? Will there be recording on audio or video? So you have to pay attention to the camera. How many people are you are you providing handouts? How are they going to be passed out? Who's going to introduce you? I I could go on for another 10 minutes rapid fire on all the things you need to know and what to do about them so you hit a grand slam every time. See, if I bomb at a presentation at my level, people could get fired. There's enormous amounts of money on the line and and people from coming in, flying in for spending thousands of dollars to come to a meeting. If I bomb, maybe... 50 people don't come next time. That's 50,000 bucks the organization lost. 
Okay, so there's a lot on the line when you reach the higher levels. And the techniques I teach you are the exact ones I've taught literally thousands of presenters over many years, and they work. Now, I challenge you to follow these 10 steps that led to my professional success and many others. These techniques, along with hard work and desire to succeed, will bring you professional success, financial wealth, and big amounts of respect among your peers. So here's what I want you to do. Go to screwthecommute.com slash resources. I haven't said that one yet today. Screwthecommute.com slash resources. And I desperately need a lodgings now. <laughs> All right. But scroll down. So screwthecommute.com slash resources. Scroll down to the public speaking session, section and dig in. I've made millions doing what are in those trainings that I have for you, and everything I have is reasonably priced for what you get. There's plenty of ripoffs out there, overhyping things and charging tens of thousands of bucks for things they've never even done themselves. But invest in yourself, and it will pay off a thousandfold. Okay, that's it for this episode. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, review, and share, 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 share. Upcoming is episode 44 with Patricia Drain. The National Association of Women Business Owners named her Business Woman of the Year. She built many businesses just for the sole purpose of selling them so she could enjoy her lifestyle business. So don't miss her episode. Okay, I'll catch you later on that episode.